Well, Isaiah 34 is going to continue with this idea of the last days. We're going to specifically get into times of the second coming. Some of the things are going to happen here. So this is, again, we're going to get more process rather than actual specific events. So this are, these are uh, this is just to understand. Okay, when we talk about Latter Day prophecy. We discussed it a little bit last time in chapter thirty-three. So now we're going to get a little bit more into this in chapter thirty-four. So verse one: Come near, ye nations, to hear and hearken, ye people. Let the earth hear and all that is therein, the world and all things that come forth of it. So this is a this is a message, an announcement to all the world. Everybody, all the people, all the animals, all the natural elements, all the atoms, everybody come hear the message of God. So verse 2, this is the beginning of the message. For the indignation of the Lord is upon all nations and his fury upon all their armies. God is not happy with the current state of what is happening in the last days. Going on here, he hath utterly destroyed them. He hath delivered them to the slaughter. What's going to happen to nations and the armies of those nations? They will be wiped out. They are going to be delivered to the slaughter. That is massive lots of life. That is total destruction. So again, if, if there is a mentality of people who believe that it is it is a righteous thing to be warlike, to be thinking of being a warrior for God and fight for right in the Lord, in the last days? No. God said right there, armies are going to be delivered to the slaughter. They're going to be taken out and killed. We don't want that warlike mentality. That's what's going to happen. The wicked will fight the wicked. They're the ones that want to fight. The people of God don't want to fight. God's going to take care of the armies for the people. Now verse 3, Their slain also shall be cast out, and their stink shall come up out of their carcasses, and the mountains shall be melted with their blood. Now that is a lot of blood. They're going to be destroyed, carcasses laying everywhere, and so much blood that it like looks like it's melting, it's covering the mountain. Lots of blood, lots of destruction, lots of problems are going to be there. And this is what God is predicting for us, basically. All nations will be experiencing this. There will not be a nation that won't experience this at some point. They might experience them at different times, but this is a big deal. This is getting into the idea of the abomination of desolations. Uh, if you're familiar with that from the book of Daniel, it's also um, the abomination of Nehor, desolations of Nehors in the book of Mormon. Uh, the AD 70 destruction of Jerusalem. Um, that's kind of what they're looking at. And it's going to be more, he's talking about global abomination of desolations. That's going to be happening in the last days. Verse four, all the, and all the host of heaven shall be dissolved and the heavens shall be rolled together as a scroll. This is getting into some symbology of Latter-day prophecy. Uh, and all their hosts shall fall down as the leaf falleth off from the vine and as a falling fig from the fig tree. So this one, we have to get into Revelations to understand this one better, basically. Um, if we get into Revelations 6, uh, verse 14, the heaven departed as a scroll when it is rolled together. Every mountain and island were moved out of their places. That's what this is talking about. So Isaiah mentioned this. Revelation 6 is mentioning this now. The JST says, And the heavens opened as a scroll is opened when it is rolled together, and every mountain and island was moved out of its place. This usually is talking about earthquake. Mountains moved out of their place. It's rolled out. If you take a scroll and you unroll it and flatten it, the high place is made low, basically. So, it's going to be a wild experience, lots of natural disaster, lots of challenges. Wars are going to end because the people who want to fight are all going to be dead. It's going to be a, a crazy time, a massive loss of life. Verse 5, for my sword, this is God's sword, shall be bathed in heaven. 
Behold, it shall come down upon Idumea, uh, which is also Edom, okay, in the Hebrew word, and upon the people of my curse to judgment. This is, now if you look at, there's in 5a with the footnotes in the King James Version for the LDS Church, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, Amos, Oba, Obadiah, there's like, and we have topical guide, world end of. Idumea usually means the world, basically. Edom was like a commerce center, the ancient world. So it's like this, everybody, it's all, it's all going to be bad. Um, and it'll come upon the people of my curse to judgment. Now, this is from, let's see, who quote with this? This is from the Old Testament study manual. And they quote a few other people in here. They say, Isaiah's description is reminiscent of a similar one in Doctrine and Covenants 8895, in which we are taught that when the Lord returns, the curtain of heaven shall be unfolded as a scroll is unfolded after it is rolled up, and the face of the Lord shall be unveiled. Then the sword of the Lord, which represents his power and judgment, shall come down upon Idumea or the world. President Joseph Fielding Smith wrote, Now, some Bible commentators, because of the name of Idumea, a little country east of the Jordan, is mentioned, have an idea that this had reference to that little country. But the term Idumea is one that the Lord uses to mean the world. You will find it so recorded in section one of the Doctrine and Covenants. He is speaking of the world. He said that in, in the Signs of the Times, page 150. Blood is a biblical symbol of wickedness. The whole earth, stained with blood, will experience a great slaughter at the time of the second coming, for it is the day of the Lord's vengeance and the year of recompenses for the controversy of Zion. That's Isaiah 34, 6 and 8. Now that, just pause for a second, I believe that's what a lot of people look at is when God comes in the day of vengeance, that is God bringing a righteous army with him to destroy the wicked. That's not what's going to happen. The wicked will be destroying the wicked. He's going to come to stop it all and deal with it after the destruction has happened, basically. Uh, President Joseph Fielding Smith again said, that is to take place in the dispensation of the fullness of times. And this prophecy had nothing to do with the little country called Idumea, but the nations of the earth. Isaiah seems to parallel passages in Ezekiel, Joel, and Jeremiah, where the great battle of Armageddon is foretold. This parallelism explains the reference to the armies and the vast slaughter that will take place. The pitch and brimstone and smoke of verse 9 and 10 suggest the results of nuclear warfare, which could logically accompany the last great wars. That is a very good possibility. Uh, so let's go to verse 6 as we continue this metaphor. The sword of the Lord is filled with blood. It is made fat with fatness and with the blood of lambs and goats. The fat of the kidneys of rams, for the Lord hath a sacrifice in Bozrah and a great slaughter in the land of Idumea. So this is dealing with, these are all parts of a sacrifice. The blood of a lamb, the fatness, the fat of the kidneys of the rams. These are the parts of the, the animals that were done for ritual sacrifices, basically. So there is a great sacrifice that is going to take place, basically, and a great slaughter in the land of Idumea. Lots of destruction, lots of things that are coming. Verse 7, and the unicorn shall come down with them. Now, unicorns, uh, re, re em in Hebrew is wild ox, basically. Uh, and the bullocks and the bulls and their land shall be soaked with blood and their dust made fat with fatness. For is, it is the day of the Lord's vengeance and the year of recompenses for the controversy of Zion. So other translations actually use the word cause instead of controversies in there. So that would say, and the year of recompenses for the cause of Zion. What is the cause of Zion? Declaring repentance and humility. That is what the cause of Zion is. Preparing the people to accept the gospel of Jesus Christ and to live the way he wants us to live. That's what he's asked us to do. He's not asking us to fight a war. He's not asking us to train for war. He's asking us to to learn to love other people. He's asking us to forgive other people of their, their indiscretions and, and wrongs against us. He's asking us to repent of our sins, to walk away from worldliness and think more celestial or spiritual minded. That is what he's talking about, is the cause of Zion. So the wicked will be destroyed 
at some point, and he's going to let them destroy themselves. He's going to let agency happen. God's not going to be like, I'm going to make these people kill themselves. That would be inappropriate. If God made you kill yourself, then how can you be blameless for what you've done? God is going to let them have their agency to do what they want. And what they want is to destroy somebody else. The problem is, is there's other people who want to destroy them and it all counteracts and they all die. That's what's going to happen. Okay, that is, this is all happening around us. Like we learned in, in chapter 33, in the last chapter of Isaiah, lots of stuff happening around us. But if you're a part of Zion, you have an opportunity to have peace and safety from the craziness around you. That's the great lesson from chapter 33, and this is continuing at 34. Now verse 9, And the streams thereof shall be turned to pitch, the dust thereof into brimstone, the land thereof shall become burning pitch. If a stream is turning to pitch, streams, water flows really well, but pitch, like from pine trees, pine pitch, is thick. So the streams will be thick with other things like dirt. Maybe it becomes more of a mud flow than anything else, or basically stops moving because it's done. It's just, it's so thick with stuff. The brimstone, the land will become a burning pitch. And a pitch burns a very long time. That stuff just doesn't stop. It just burns. It's really good stuff to use if you want to make a torch. Get some pitch on the end of a stick when you're camping and get it lit. Man, that stuff will go. It's, it's, it's amazing. Um, in fact, verse 10, it says, And it shall not be quenched night or day. The smoke thereof shall go up forever from generation to generation. It shall lie waste. None shall pass through it forever and ever. This is going to be a crazy time. Lots of destruction. Again, Zion will be relatively safe from this. So be here, not out fighting. Be here. Uh, verse 11, they're going to go in a little bit different direction here. It says, but the cormorant and the bittern shall possess it. Now this is interesting. The cormorant is, uh, when you look at these, this is the owl, the raven, like animals and things, they shall dwell in it, which means there's no humans. If animals are coming back to live in places, humans have, ev have evacuated out. They're not there anymore. He shall stretch out upon it the line of confusion and the stones of emptiness. This is dealing with the, like a plummet, a measure, okay, to know exact up and down, basically. Um, Verse 12, they shall call the nobles thereof to the kingdom, but none shall be there. And her princes shall be nothing. So again, there's no government. There's no royalty to run the kingdom. They're not going to be there. Verse 13, thorns shall come up in her palaces, nettles and brambles in the fortresses thereof. It shall be an inhabitation of dragons and a court for owls. Now, verse 13, the footnote for in the Hebrew says, another translation is the resort of jackals. So more of your uh, uh, sc uh, scrounging uh, animals, basically. So again, if you've got thorns growing in your palace, plants going wild inside, it's because there's no humans. What The wilderness is taking these places back over because the humans are gone. They've, they're, they're destroyed. Verse 14, the wild beasts of the desert shall also meet with the wild beasts of the island. And the satyr shall cry to his fellow. The screech owl also shall rest there and find for herself a place of rest. This is really an interesting thing in here. And I'm going to just, something interesting. Okay, so this idea of the screech owl shall find rest there and find for herself a place of rest. Okay, Isaiah 34, 14 is a significant verse. Herself, a place of rest is Lilith. You may have heard that term before. Let me get into some ideas here. This is where the traditions of Lilith come from. Okay, this term Lilith came from Akkadian, which got it from Sumerian. In the King James Version, it is used as a screech owl. It comes from an idea of demon or creature that has some feminine quality and possibly sexual deviancy. This is an uninhabitable place this scripture is describing, a no man's land. 
In the Dead Sea Scrolls of Isaiah, Lilith is plural, denoting more of a category than a person. The legend of Lilith comes from the idea that since Genesis 1 and Genesis 2 both cover the creation but talk about it differently, that maybe there was two creation periods. Now here's, here's the thing. If you're going, what? What the heck is up with this? I, what are you talking about? Let's, let's talk about this for a second, okay? There is a, since around 800 BC, there has been a, a philosophy that has just kind of been kept around not mainstream philosophy, but just kind of there sometimes, uh, of a woman named Lilith. And uh, the legend has it, as we're talking about here, that uh, there were two creative periods. Or some people have interpreted it. So Genesis 1 and Genesis 2, if you read them, both talk about the creative periods. Some people have said, well, because the creative period is mentioned twice... It's not two different versions of the same creative period. It's two different creative periods. So some people have made this assumption that, that God created everything and then kind of destroyed it and then started over again, kind of a deal. Um, and in this creative period, Adam ended up with two wives. His first wife was Lilith. And Lilith basically said, I don't want to follow God's commandments. I don't want to do it this way. And so she was punished and cast out, kind of made like to be a demon on the earth. And her job is to basically destroy, seduce men and destroy marriages, destroy families, kill babies, those kinds of things. If you think about it, it's the same message as what in the, especially in the endowment ceremony in the LDS temples, what Satan says he's going to do basically. Um, and that's kind of where this idea of Lilith comes from. And, and this is where we hear this idea of the screech owl, Lilith shall rest there and find for herself a place of rest. So she's traveling through the world. She is trying to seduce men, break up marriages, destroy the family, kill babies that aren't protected from her, all these crazy things. Um, she is a tradition that is still talked about. She's just more of a legend these days. But in the old days, there was this idea that was around. And again, it comes from Isaiah 34, 14. So that's where around 800 BC, these stories started to come around. Um, because of the translation of the word screech owl is Lilith, which in other languages means a woman's name. So that's what this is coming down to. Okay. So this is saying, basically, if it was true that there were two creative periods, uh, if it, if true, it would have Adam with two wives, Lilith would be the first who was rejected for wanting to be on top or in the dominant position in the relationship. So when it came down to it saying, okay, I want this to be this way, you know, women, you'll be, uh, you know, men will be given the priesthood, they'll have the priesthood and you will be, uh, with them, but they will be the priesthood holder. So they are kind of the leader, if you will. And she says, no, I want to be the one that's the leader. Um, and Dan, Dan McClellan talks a lot about this in some of his stuff in ancient, ancient uh, biblical ideas of the whole idea of being on top. Uh, the, the concept of the sexual position of woman on top was banned in the Old Testament times, in those ancient times, because it was seen as the Lilith position. It was the beyond the power because sex back then wasn't so it was procreation. But sex back then was also used as a dominance factor. They didn't have the concept of sexual abuse. They didn't have a concept of homosexuality. All they had the concept of sex is a way for me to prove I am above you. So having sex with you, whether you are my same sex or my opposite sex, with me on top means I dominate you. It was a dominance power factor. And that's where this concept kind of gets convoluted in with Lilith. Um, the document Alphabet of Ben Sira is where we get this idea from. It comes from around 800 AD, which is, again, similar with about the time Isaiah was around. Uh, it says that since Lilith was rejected, she would curse men and children on earth. The story says God found out and sent three angels to convince her to come back. She refuses to come back, but said she would afflict children unless they were wearing an amulet with their three names on it. It's probably a story to explain common issues in society. It's not a real story. So this is where these origination ideas 
they've kind of come back in our day and age in this idea of the goddess of, you know, how can women be equal or superior to men? And uh, this idea of there was an ancient goddess that was suppressed and kind of came back up into this idea is, is there's a resurgence of this concept of Lilith in today's world because of the conceptualization of women wanting to be equal or better than men in, in a lot of ways. And it's a, it's, a, it's, it starts with a bad premise is what it does. And maybe we'll make a video on something like that later, but this is, this is where it's coming in is Isaiah 34, 14 is kind of a tie in of how they try to pull this together. Basically it's an ancient document. You can look up Lilith, you can look up, um, Ben Sira, the alphabet of Ben Sira. It's, Dan McClellan and a lot of ancient scholars believe that it was created as a way to explain why some children die at birth and why some men are idiots and unfaithful to their wives. And so it's probably, again, a way of describing what they don't understand. We, we have a lot of science today, so we can say, oh, here's why, you know, sudden infant death syndrome is a legit thing. We understand it and can mitigate it in today's world. Back then, they just know they woke up and their, their baby's dead. So Lilith came and got it at the night. So this was, it's again, it's a way of explaining supernatural things. It was some form of a logical explanation. Um, but I wanted you to be aware of that because that does show up because of how, with Isaiah 34, 14. But again, Isaiah 34, 14 is not talking about uh, this demon woman or this, this woman, this, this legend. It's talking about how there is a uh, so much destruction in the last days that again the owls will come back to rest. They are going, you know, animals will come back and start living in homes, not because they become domesticated, but because there's no humans there. They've abandoned them. They're not there. So the population will have diminished and have moved and changed dramatically. Basically, uh, verse fifteen. There shall the great owl make her nest and lay and hatch and gather under her shadow. There shall the vultures also be gathered, everyone with her mate. So again, that's this idea of nature is going to take a lot of things back in the earth. A lot of cities will be taken back by nature because there's no inhabitants. There's just nobody there. They're empty. They're gone. They're desolate because of all the destructions that are that, are, that will have happened in the in these Last few moments, the, the destruction will be the worst right before Christ comes, basically. Now, verse 16, seek ye out of the book of the Lord and read. This is the book of the Lord is an important point. But before we read this, let me, let me talk about this. Um, this is the Old Testament study manual. It goes into this. Not all people, of course, are wicked and those who are not willing to be saved from the destroying fire, both the, the spiritual hell and the physical the names of the children of the Lord who have kept their covenants are enrolled in a special book known as the Book of the Lord. Uh, it's called the Book of the Law of God in DNC 85 uh, or the Book of Life in Revelations 20. This is a book kept in heaven of what we do in our life. Records of our works are kept on earth by the Lord's clerks, but the Book of Life is the record kept in heaven. Both records should agree, according to DNC 128, 6 through 9. Of those whose names are recorded in the heavenly book, no one of these shall fail. That's according to this, what we're reading here in verse 16. The promise that none shall want their mate or lack their mate is that there's a Joseph Smith translation that goes with this verse, is particularly interesting to Latter day Saints since we know that only through the ordinance of celestial marriage can we have our mate eternally. So we're going to see this in here. So let's finish reading verse 16. Seek ye out of the book of the Lord and read, no one of these shall fell. None shall want her mate. That is sealing. That is celestial marriage. For my mouth it hath commanded and his spirit it hath gathered them. So this book is talked about throughout the scripture, we're talking about, it's talked about in Revelations, it's talking about Doctrine and Covenants, it's talking about the Old Testament. This is the book of life. This is the book of God. There are angels who their whole job is to just document what we do in this life. 
they can see everything in our life. They know what we're doing. They know what's going on. They understand our thoughts. They're documenting it. And this is the book we will be judged out of, according to Revelations, the book of life. They'll open it up and go, okay, let's go through your life and let's review it. Um, this is the challenge. And so here, here's the thing. And what we learn in the scriptures is when they open that book, here's one thing that can happen. If we repent, if we give our sins to Christ, if we allow his atonement to work in our life, when they open that book, they will not see their, our sins. They, When we repent and we allow, allow that atonement in our life, our sins, our faults, our problems will be erased. They're taken out of the book. So when they open it up and go, okay, let's look at the list of your sins. Oh, there's none here. Look at that, how great that is. Because Christ will take all of that. We don't have to worry about it. Now, if we do not give our sins to Christ, we have to pay for those. That's the damnation of hell. That's what all of that stuff is. In the spirit world, we have to pay the price for your own sins. Uh, spirit prison, those kinds of things. Uh, as well as a little bit of the, the telestial kingdom will be a part of that also. You're going to have to pay for your sins. You didn't give your sins to Christ. You've got to take care of that. I think Teresh will have a little bit of that as well. Um, but mostly, you know, spirit prison and the telestial kingdom will have most of that. Um, but this is, this will also document, I think there's going to be two lists. List of your sins you still haven't taken care of. You've got to reconcile that out. And list of the ordinances, the good things you have done, the commandments you have kept. And if you look at that and go, oh, look, there's no sins because you've allowed the atonement of Christ to take them. You've been baptized. You've been washed clean. You've been taking the sacrament. You've been doing things to repent and be humble. Try to keep the commandments of God as best you can. Even if you stumble and fall sometimes, so long as you are repenting, that key, you know they might, you, they might be erasing as fast as they're writing them down in some people's lives. You know, if you, sometimes we feel that way. Oh, I, I get better, but then I fall back. I lapse and I get better and I fall back and I lapse. You just write it up, oh, turn the pen around, erase it, turn it back around, write it a bit. Oh, no, he goofed again. All right, erase Oh, no, here we do. You know, that can happen. That can happen. Uh, and then get your ordinance work done. Have the, keep the commandments, do what God has asked us to do. So they see no sins, all your ordinances done, you're in. That's the celestial kingdom. That's the opportunities. That's what they're talking about here. Uh, now, verse 17, the final verse here, And he hath cast a lot for them, and his hand hath divided it unto them by line. They shall possess it forever. From generation to generation shall they dwell therein. Again, Christ has paid the price for us. He's the one that is going to erase our sins. He is going to take care of all of that for us. That is what happens when we repent of our sins, when we pray and ask him to forgive us and we help strive to not make that sin again and make it right. If we've offended somebody, if we've hurt somebody, make it right. Have that humility to do that. Have the honesty and integrity to say, I'm sorry, I need to help make this right. That is what's going to help us in the long run. That is is what we should be working on. That's the, that's the message of the gospel of Jesus Christ, is repentance. Change. Get away from the worldliness. Get away from sinning. Go from sinning to not sinning and avoiding sin and getting more righteous. Keep moving towards God. Keep moving in that direction. It's going to continue to help us. That's what this message is about. And for the in the last days, in our day and age, this is super, super important because it's going to get a lot worse, like President Nelson has said. And we can see, if you read 30, Isaiah 33 and 34, this is the trend. This is the pattern. We're being shown it. We're not seeing the specifics. That comes up in other places, like in Revelations and other things. This is the pattern. Here it is. We know what's coming. We can't say we were surprised. Let's be prepared. Let's repent. Let's follow Christ. Put him as the center of your life. Do more to keep him in your life every single day. Thanks for watching. Hope you guys are really enjoying these videos. 
Uh, let's jump over to our next chapter as we continue this amazing education for the last days that Isaiah has given us.